So we were talking about ethics, and we'll start talking about uh, some valid ethical theories in just a second, and then we'll watch a video um, on this idea about justice and the application of marketing. We have a guest speaker for a few minutes. Dr. Bahuth is asked to come and talk to you about some opportunities that we offer in the College of Business that I think you really should seriously consider because we're one of the few colleges that really does provide a very good benefit to you if you want to travel and uh, get some exposure to other cultures and other uh, things that are important in a interconnected and globally um, competitive marketplace. So Dr. Perdue from the Information uh, Science and Operations Management. My name is Saba Mahout and I'm a professor here at UCO and I'm in the Department of Information Systems and Operations Management. I teach operations management and uh, I don't recognize many of your faces so I guess uh, you also do not know. But the reason I'm here is not for the, course, uh, the courses that I teach here and in, in the classroom that says operations management. This is not the uh, most interesting course in the world. What I uh, believe is much more interesting among the courses uh, that I teach is the study tour to Paris that we conduct twice a year. Uh, we have one that is coming up uh, in, uh, during the spring break and uh, I want to do, talk to you for a couple of minutes about this. Uh, we conduct this study tour to Paris twice a year, once in, during the spring break, instead of going to, and to the beach somewhere in, uh, in Texas, you can go to Paris and uh, there wouldn't be any beach in, the, uh, in March over there, but uh, you can enjoy Paris and all the things that we do in Paris. The other one we do is during August, very early in August before the start of the semester. And typically, what we do, it is a three credit hour course uh, that we can replace uh, your international course. You, you know that you all have a section called take one of the following international courses. So you can take it instead of this course, or you can take it as an elective. And those who are in the international business program, this fits very well also in, in your international business curriculum. Uh, we spend around 10 days over there in Paris. Before we go to Paris, we prepare here where we have like four lectures on the weekend where we prepare to study about Paris, about the culture over there. We study about their history uh, so that when we go over there, we appreciate what we see. So when uh, we go to Paris, you, can, you do not stop in front of a building and look at it as a bunch of stones and let's move to something else. No, you know the history behind it and who built it, why and when and so on, so you really appreciate it much more. Uh, and uh, we typically are busy all day long from early in the morning, from around uh, 8.30 in the morning until uh, late in the evening. And we visit like two places in the morning, two places in the afternoon, and uh, the evening is to have fun and go to places where tourists go. Uh, we visit places like uh, a champagne company where you learn how to make your own champagne. You cannot make your own champagne, but you see them making and how they make champagne. We go to a perfume factory where you can uh, buy their own, uh, you see, uh, kind of uh, how they make the perfume and then you can buy the perfume. We visit uh, uh, castles and uh, some of the most famous castles in uh, Europe and uh, chateaus and uh, also cathedrals and uh, have fun also in the evening. So the university or the College of Business actually provide an excellent opportunity for that because the cost of the trip is 3500 $5, but let's forget about the $5. So 3500 uh, uh, However, for all of you who are College of Business students who have a GPA of 2.5 or above, and it's not big deal getting the 2.5, I hope uh, you, you're above that, uh, so you get a $1,000 scholarship 
that will reduce that for your cost to from 3,500 to 2,500. Now, we do not wait until uh, the enrollment of the spring semester to start to enroll students in this course because we have to enroll students way ahead of time and uh, because we want to have tickets for airplane tickets and uh, hotel reservations and so on. And I only take 10 students, 10 and only 10 students, uh, because we, don't, we want to be a small group to, so that we'll go fast from one place to another. Uh, and especially for restaurants, when we go to restaurants, we, if it's a large group, they cannot accommodate us. And I only have four seats left. So if you are interested, come and see me as soon as possible. I have, it is very well detailed on the internet, but I have a website that details all the conditions and what you need to do and what, uh, the schedule when we go and what we see and so on. And the address of the website is on this bookmark here. So I have bookmarks for you that are for free. You can get the bookmark for free. I'm not charging you any of the uh, money, but uh, if any one of you is interested or want to go and see what is on the website, uh, you are more than welcome to have these. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, pass them over there. And And thank you so much. Do you have any questions before I? Did you raise your hand? Do you have any questions? There's a question. Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, oh okay. okay. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll be coming up. When does the 2500 need to be paid for this? Well, it is uh, three payments. In three payments. The first payment, 1200 is due when you enroll with me. If you come this afternoon, for example, to enroll, I'll tell you uh, 1200 is check written to UCO, and you sign a paper, and you are enrolled. Uh, the second payment is, I think, 1st of December, okay. and it is on the website, it's detailed on the website. I'll the third see. payment, the university, the College of Business pays the third payment, which is 1000 mm -hmm. Okay. So 1200 1300 that you pay, okay. and then if you have 2.5, the university pays uh, for it. Nice, thank you. You got one. Anyone else here? Okay. We were talking last time about this idea of justice and ethics and marketing, and we'll continue that on today, and then we'll have part of it uh, on Thursday as well, and we'll go into marketing research, and we'll look at how justice and ethics and these concepts apply to the field of marketing research, where you might think that there's absolutely no application. We'll watch a video on that on Thursday, and we'll watch a video today. So just as kind of a recap, we talked about some challenges to ethics and to what it is that we can know. So philosophy attempts to answer three great questions. Those questions are what? What are the questions? I did talk about this, right? Yes? The challenges to ethics are what? Subjectivism. Psychological egoism, cultural relativism. Philosophy attempts to answer three questions. The question of knowledge, what is it I can know, which we did this thing where I asked you what this is, and we couldn't decide what this is, so if we can't even decide what this is, how are we going to know anything about justice? The question of conduct, once I decide what it is I can know, how should I behave? And the question of governance. That's the third question. The things that make these challenges, subjectivism, cultural relativism, and psychological egoism not valid theories, are what? Did I talk about that? Yeah. What? Yeah, solipsism, it allows for you or your group to say, I'm a special, I'm an exception. They're not based, they're based then on emotion, because you're allowed to say I'm an exception, 
And as a result, we can't form universal principles based on them. So what are some valid ethical theories on which we can base universal principles or we can ascertain universal principles or maxims? The one that students like the most, particularly business students and marketing students, is called the theory of utility or teleological ethics. It focuses on the ends. This is the Greek root word for end. The reason that business students like this theory is that it is the one on which capitalism is founded for the most part. In a capitalistic society, what we focus on and what economists talk a lot about, and if you want to get a totally worthless degree that does nothing more than rename things that we understand intuitively with fancy terms, get a degree in economics, because that's what they do. They, they rename things that we all understand intuitively with a fancy term. That's all they do. And economists talk about the maximization of utility. And what this means is that you should get the most bang for your buck. So when you spend your money, and they say that the efficient market hypothesis ensures this that those people who want a good or service the most will be willing to pay for it. So when you want something, you pay money for it, and that gives you value. You, have, you appreciate it. You value that object. This is called a private good. And utilitarianism in ethics, it says it's not about the maximization of utility or money value, but the maximization of happiness. Yes? This says that the root word of tele is distant. It's end. They, that Google is wrong. And distance would, distance would be, uh, I guess, it, well, it's wrong. It's, telio is end, or I guess you could say distance, the destination, the journey, whatever, it's end. So we're going to focus on the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Now this sounds good, doesn't it? What is good about this theory? Well, it does not have the problems that the challenges to ethics have. It doesn't allow for exceptionalism. You're not going to be able to say it's the greatest good for me or it's the greatest good for my group. You're going to have to say what is the greatest good for everyone involved. And in business we talk about, and in marketing, as a result of sustainability and this idea of utilitarian ethics or teleological ethics, we're going to think about the triple bottom line, which is people, planet, profits. People, planet, profits. This idea of sustainability and the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Is there anything that could be wrong with this? Theory. The greatest good for the greatest good. Let's create happiness. When government gets too involved. What? When government gets too involved in the market, the prices get too low. Okay. Can we go like to an extreme of that? Well, okay. teleological ethicists would say government, in that instance, shouldn't be involved. So we talked about this idea of the law. Is the law an important consideration? Should business people follow the law? What if the law itself is immoral? Are they obligated to follow it if the law itself is immoral? I don't know. 
Now, let's think about this. The problem is now it, it, it allows us to focus on an absolutely rational solution. What is going to be the best outcome for the most number of people? Absolutely rational solution. We can formulate universal principles based on this solution. Okay, in every interaction I have with other people, I have to think about how I can maximize the overall happiness for everybody. And it doesn't allow me to say I'm an exception to that. So it's based on logic. We can, we can formulate universal principles, and therefore, uh, we can say that this is a valid theory, because it doesn't allow for this exceptionalism. Well, is there ever a time when we might not want to focus on the greatest happiness? Where we're, where we're going to say, maybe we shouldn't do that kind of calculation on things. During a war, you can't, you can't necessarily focus on the greatest happiness because you're just creating a whole lot of misery. Different things make different things. Different things make different things. So how are we going to measure happiness or the absence of pain? That could be problematic. How are we going to do the calculus? Let's think about this example along those lines of different things make different people happy. Let's suppose, and you can do this, you can go and see an example of this in action at the Titanic exhibit in Branson, Missouri. Anybody been there to Branson, Missouri, to the Titanic? It's a great museum. It looks like the museum itself looks like the Titanic. And your boarding card, your ticket, when you go and you pay, they give you a ticket and it's got a name on it. It's a boarding card for the Titanic. And at the end of this exhibit, you get to see whether or not you lived or died. I've done it three times. I've always lived. It's been great. So you and I are on the Titanic. And we've all seen the movie with the skinny little kid, who apparently is not so skinny anymore. His girlfriend has told Leonardo that he's fat and needs to lose weight. So says People Magazine. So I was looking at it in the checkout the other day. But, you know, we're lucky. We made it on a lifeboat. But we're taking on water. And we look down and it says, maximum occupancy. Four people, and shucks, we have five. There's you, there's me, there's Donald Trump, Mother Teresa, and some guy named Bob, who smells like soured milk. Because, in the words of Eric Cartman, poor people tend to get investors. <laughs> Who do we get rid of? Subjective. Bob. <laughs> Who? What did we say? Did you say me? No. <laughs> what? What's your name? <laughs> you know it, it's really unimportant whether or not you like me, it's more important that I like you. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you should get rid of me. I'm a lawyer. We've all heard the jokes. What do you call 50,000 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. <laughs> What's the difference between a dead skunk on the road and a dead lawyer on the road? There are skid marks in front of the skunk. <laughs> well, now, now look, we can't get rid of me. I come down here, I, uh, I'm alert and chirpy, and I give you all of this knowledge that's going to make you a better person, a better marketer. I went from being a lawyer to being a marketer. The people who bought you tele, uh, telesales and, you know, used car, I don't know which is worse. What about you? You're young, you have your whole... Do you see what we're doing here? We're engaging in a calculus on a human life. And it's kind of creepy, isn't it? To say one life is worth more than another, it's kind
kind of creepy. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yes? Couldn't the fifth person just hang on to the raft and decide, maybe? It's freezing cold water. They, that's one of the things that you can do in this exhibit. They have an absolute replica of the bridge of the Titanic. So you get to go in and you see the bridge and it's got this, and it looks like it's night outside. And then when you can walk out on the bow of the boat, you can actually put your hand in the water and feel the temperature that the water was that night. So, you know, I mean, don't you remember the part where the skinny kid's in the water and has hypothermia and dies and she has to let him go? I mean, so yeah, we, I guess we could do that for a little bit, but someone's going to have to get the water. Who are we going to decide? Yes. I'm sure you can tell Trump you'll pay him later. He'll come from the water and he'll hide him later. But yeah, well, I mean, you know, he, he's obnoxious. Maybe we should get rid of him. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mother Teresa will say, I'll take one for the team. The problem with that is she's a saint. These people don't come along every day. You're going to need them at some point, right? There's another problem with utilitarianism. How do we determine what's going to bring about the most greatest happiness? The purest form of utilitarianism, of teleological ethics, is what we might call act utilitarianism. And what act utilitarianism says is that in every single interaction with other people, we have to do the calculus in our own head. And this can be problematic in terms of, is, is it, can we really do that? So maybe what we want, and because there are some things that we would say maybe we shouldn't do, like we shouldn't sacrifice people, even for the greater good, what we'll do is we'll develop rules. The second form of utilitarianism is rule utility, which says, well, we don't really need to always do the calculus on our own. We can develop rules that will channel things to produce the greatest good. Let's take another example where act utilitarianism might be problematic. If we went back to the beginning of the 20th century and the start of the Industrial Revolution, we would not really be able to say that, that those people that were industrialists who led to pollution and a lot of the problems that we experience today were bad people because they couldn't necessarily foresee the consequences of their actions. Would you say that people who didn't know anything about, for example, atmospheric pollution were bad people because there are bad results that ended up happening from it? I don't think most of us would hold those people morally culpable. <coughs> so rural utilitarians come up with uh, an alternative to this, and they say, well, what we ought to do is we ought to focus on rules that we can develop that will take care of this problem of externalities. Yes? What about the people who said that letting gasoline is a good thing? What? The people who said that letting gasoline is a good thing because it got paid to say it. Well, I, you know, I think that you would say, uh, if you've seen a movie called Thank You for Smoking, that actually happened. They actually tried to get in. They actually got scientists to try and prove that there was no causal link. And I think utilitarians would say, you knew that there was a problem, right, at that point. I don't know that early industrialists, though, I don't know that you could say Henry Ford was a bad guy because he's created a huge pollution problem that was unforeseen at the time he invented the mass-produced modern car, right? So what we'll do is we'll come up with rules that will try and deal with these externalities. We'll come up with rules and situations. And this is highlighted by something called the prisoner's dilemma. From economics, this is game theory. How many of you have had game theory at some point? So the prisoner's dilemma is a classic one, an example of how we can develop rules uh, for things that deal with this problem of externalities. So in the prisoner's dilemma, this is what we call a game of complete but imperfect information. It's complete because you know what the outcomes are, but you don't know how your partner is behaving, so it's imperfect. You have talk, silence, right? Talk, silence. You have two people that have committed a crime, and we'll have the playoffs be prisoner one, prisoner two. You have two people that have committed a crime 
and the police have enough evidence to convict them of a lesser crime. Let's say that they have committed the crime of burglary. And common law burglary was defined as the breaking and entering the dwelling house of another in the nighttime with the intent to commit a felony therein. And usually the felony therein that burglars want to commit is what? Theft. It's theft because they want to get something that they can then sell to get money. Now let's suppose that the police are relatively certain that these two individuals have committed the crime of burglary because they've got the stolen property on them, but they can't prove because there's no eyewitnesses and no cameras that show them breaking into the house and they're very smart criminals who have worn gloves and not left any fingerprints that the police can do. So all they have is this sort of circumstantial evidence that they've got stolen property. Let's suppose that they can convict them of possession of stolen property, a lesser offense than burglary, but they want to convict them of burglary, and so they're gonna need one of, or both of them to do what? Confess, right? So if they both talk, they'll get the maximum penalty of 10 years. If one talks and the other one doesn't, the one that talks first will get a slight benefit, a reduction of their sentence, and they will get seven years, so talk, and the other one will get uh, the most. And then it would be 10, seven. But if neither of them talk, they'll get three and three, because all they can be convicted of is the crime of possession of, of stolen goods. Where do the prisoners want to be? Yeah, you want to end up here, but where do you end up? You always end up here. This is the Nash equilibrium. How many of you have seen a movie called The Beautiful Mind? It's about an economist who comes up with this Nash equilibrium. Why do they all game theory. Why do they always, and why does this highlight the idea of rule utility? Because what are the police going to do when they capture the prisoner? Separate. They're going to separate. They're not going to let them stay together, right? Interrogation is not a fun thing. They don't. They don't bring you a. a they don't put you on a little couch like the psychiatrist's office and bring you a cup of tea, give you a cookie. They separate you into two different rooms and what are they going to say to each prisoner? Your, your buddy's about to talk. But you I can really get, but you know that they say that. Right. But, and you know this, but where do you always end up? After five or six hours, you start to wonder. That you, you, you'll talk. I would think. You'll both talk because they'll say, we know. He's giving us details. Because then it's like, if you know, then why wouldn't you talk? Just don't well, it'll go a lot easier for you if you talk, and they both end up talking. It's amazing. <laughs> this is Professor Aguirre's rule number one of committing. I used to teach criminal law procedure. Commit crime on your own. Because I don't <laughs> care who it is, if it's, if it's your brother. When the police start with the interrogation and the light in the face, then you will talk. And you'll both talk, and you'll both get the maximum sentence. Now, this is a rule that says we've got, now we've taken two bad men off the street, we've increased happiness for a long period of time because we allowed the police to lie to the prisoners, right? We've got a rule that says the police can lie to you. And when the man with the badge is talking to you, he's lying to you. Trust me. I practiced criminal defense law long enough to know. They all lie. It's the rule of tall. They all lie. They're lying to you. But can you lie to the police? No, we have a rule that says you can't lie to the police. What was Martha Stewart convicted on? No, they couldn't prove insider trading. They could prove that she lied to a federal officer. That's what they convicted her on. Insider. So we have a rule, we come up with rules, we don't look at individual acts, we come up with rules in society that deal with this problem of the externalities, maybe, that we face. As a result, some ethicists have said we can't focus on the ends justifying the means, even if we come up with rules. We're going to have to come up with a better system, and that's duty ethics, or deontological ethics. 
the ontology is duty based. So how are we going to ascertain the duties? What is a duty? How can we know a duty? Well, the major thinker here is a guy named Immanuel Kant. And he has three great works. There's actually more, but in terms of ethics, the three are a critique of practical reason, a critique of pure reason, and the metaphysics of morals. So Kant says, and I've often thought that for students who fall asleep in my class, forcing them to listen to me read the critique of pure reason very slowly would be the perfect punishment, because it's rather dry. If you want to read a great work of philosophy, from time to time students have asked me, what should I know to be truly educated, and I have a list of books that you should have read to be truly educated. One of them is Republic by Plato. It's a nice, easy read. It's a dialogue. It's like a play. It deals with this problem of justice. <coughs> the critique of practical reason, the critique of pure reason are, are more difficult to read. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, even more difficult. Very dry and boring. So if you want to read a great work, read, read Republic. It's, uh, it's easy to read. It's rather thick, though. You can do the trial and death of Socrates. That's also a good one. That's a dialogue. It's shorter. The Mino, shorter. Kant says there are two types of imperatives. There are hypothetical imperatives. And there are categorical imperatives. Hypothetical imperatives exist because we have some desire, which may or may not have moral import. So for example, why are you all here? You have a hypothetical imperative, which is what? What? Graduate. To graduate. But more than that, what's your imperative? Okay. Education. You want to get a job. That's it. Because you want to get you want to get a job. What? Because it's required. Because it's required. It's not nothing is required. It's all optional. You don't have to get a degree, right? You don't have to be here. Just like the tests, they're all optional. You don't have to take them. I can't force you. I'm not the government, right? You can't make me take the test. It's all optional. You have a hypothetical imperative, which is what? What do you want the degree? You want a better job, huh? You want money. You want a better. You want a better life. And we know that people who have college degrees make more money on average than those that don't. So if you want to get a better job, or you want to have a shot at a better job, get a college degree. That's a hypothetical imperative. So what are you going to do to achieve that hypothetical imperative? Well, you applied to UCO, you got admitted, and then you did what? You selected a major, you enrolled in classes, you, you looked at the degree sheet to figure out what it is that you had to have. That's a hypothetical imperative. If you want to get a better job, you should go to college. Pretty straightforward and simple. Categorical imperatives, on the other hand, exist because there is a moral duty. How do we ascertain what the moral duty is? Now this is one that's problematic maybe for marketers. Kant says the formulation for a moral duty is that in all other interactions with the rational being, you must act in such a way as to treat that individual as an end in and of themselves, and never as a means to an end. You must treat every other rational being as an end in and of themselves, and never as a means to an end. What does this mean? Don't use people. Don't use people. So you can never do what? Lie. You can never lie. Why not? When you lie, what are you doing? 
You're manipulating another individual. You're not allowing them, as an individual, to make an autonomous choice. You are manip Never lie. Now let's think about this. Never lie. You can't begin to recite the categorical imperative after a glass or two of wine and not sort of begin to chuckle. Never lie. Never. Never lie. How many of you have an insignificant other? <laughs> How many of you have a significant other? How many of you have a spouse? Lawfully married? A few of you. You, sir, in the black shirt. You've got a, a wife. 43 years. 43? Wow! 43 years. I'm good for about five. <laughs> I've been married three times. Five years each. Then it ends in disaster. Never lie. Well, mine ends in disaster because I say things like, how do I look in this outfit? You look like death in pastels, Robin. Go back upstairs and change. <laughs> Brutal honesty. <laughs> Never lie. <laughs> Is it acceptable? And, you know, how about this? You know? The Nazis are at the door. Where are the Jews? <coughs> Conklin said you can't lie. For most of us, that is just too harsh. Right? It's just too harsh of a standard. And so we would say, yeah, you should not lie. And in business, we should not lie. Right? Now, in negotiations, how many of you have seen a movie called Pretty Woman? Richard Gere, right? At the end of that movie, Richard Gere is what we call an arbitrageur, and there is an old saying, if you give a man a fish, you, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you will feed him for a lifetime. If you teach a man to arbitrage, you will feed him and his family for generations to come. And Richard Gere is an arbitrageur. And as part of that, he's having to negotiate with this guy and the guy says, well, I'll buy back your stocks. And he says, no, you won't. And he says, yes, we will. We have government contracts to build ships for the Navy. And he's like, no, Navy ship uh, contracts are canceled. We talked to Senator Stevens on the Appropriations <coughs> Committee, and it's, it's a done deal. And he says, you have dirty politicians in your, in your back pocket? And at the end, he says, well, what about my contracts? And Richard Gere has this change of heart, right? and decides he's going to be a good guy and he's going to help this guy save his company and not engage in arbitrage. And the guy says, well, what about my contracts? He said, well, they were just delayed. I was bluffing. And he says, you were very good at it. And Richard Gere says, thank you. It's my job. It's never lie in business? Never lie? I don't know. Most of us would say you shouldn't lie, but there are certainly exceptions. To, to the rule, right? But it's a good idea. The third uh, big ethical theory goes back to Aristotle, and it's called virtue ethics. Virtue ethics. What we see in two great works that Aristotle writes is this fleshing out of the virtues. In the Nicomachean Ethics and the Eudamian Ethics, <coughs> Aristotle begins with, well, we have to ascertain what the purpose of a human being is. What is the purpose of a human being? What do you think it is that you're made to be? Session of the family name. What? Session of the family name. Continue on with the family name. That's what your purpose is? To, to promulgate your lineage? Is that what the purpose of the human being is? Aristotle says it's eudaimonia in ancient Greek. Now, how is this world generally translated? Eudaimonic 
is usually translated from ancient Greek as being happiness. But I don't think we can think of it as in drink up, let's have another round type happiness. It's got to be more than that. I think, and Sir Anthony Kenny and uh, Professor Daniel Robinson both say that a better translation of this idea of eudaimonic is flourishing. It's the flourishing life. How do we achieve the flourishing life? Well, we see this in the Eudamian and the Nicomachean ethics. It's this idea of balance and proportionality in all things. So for example, in his treatise on friendship, Aristotle says there are three types of friendships. Nothing wrong with any of these types, but just recognizing the limitation of them. Think about these. And they're beneficial to marketers because when we think about this idea of value co-creation and this era of relationship building, I think we can take something from Aristotle. Aristotle says there are friendships that are grounded on utility. Nothing wrong with them, but just recognize that when the utility ends, they're, they're predicated on usefulness. Once the utility ends, what happens to the friendship? It will vanish. How many of you have a job? How many of you had a job before this job? Quite a few of you. So you've had more than one job in your life. In the red shirt and the beard, you've had more than one job. Yes, sir. When you left, when you what, what was your first job? When? I don't know, high school. Uh, delivery pizza. You delivered pizza for? Simple Simon. Simple Simon. Do you have friends that work there with you? Yep. Are they still your friends? Yeah. All of them? Two of the ones that were there, yeah. Two of the, well, how many people worked there? Eight. Eight. So two of eight stayed friends with you. Of the others, did you just not like them that much? Just uh, work associates. Just work associates. So you, you liked them, you talked to them, you said hello, you were friendly. After you left, Simple Simon went where? Uh, the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps. You didn't stay friends with all of them. Why? Left. Left, didn't have a lot in common. The utility died. We're all friends with people at work. And when we change jobs, we get new friends. Because new people are useful to us. Nothing wrong with that. But just a recognition that they'll move on. Sometimes customers will move on. And in this idea of value co-creation, we talk about customer lifetime value. There are some customers you may not want to keep. Right? Because they cost more money than they're worth. At the other end of the spectrum are friendships that are grounded in pleasure. Again, nothing wrong with these, but once the pleasure is over, the friendship will end. In the middle, the middle ground is friendship that is perfected. You befriend your best friend because you want what's best for him or her. Perfected friendship. You don't want anything out of it. You want what's best for them. You it's, it's friendship predicated on a, lo a lasting or enduring desire. These are the friends of a lifetime that you can count on one hand. And you see this balance and proportionality in everything Aristotle does. So he says one of the things we have to do in establishing this flourishing life is we have to decide what are extreme defects in character. What's an extreme defect in character? Cowardice. What's the opposite of cowardice? Yeah, it's the heedless person. It's the person who will charge into battle at any fight. So we have the coward at one end, and the heedless person at the other. What's the middle ground? Courage. The courageous person knows when to fight the good fight. You can do this for all kinds of things, right? You don't have to be brutally honest. What's, what's an extreme defect? Somebody who's always deceitful, the habitual liar. What's the opposite of that? Me. Brutal honesty at all costs. There's discretion 
in between, right? Good taste. Not hurting people's feelings. Although maybe you should think about the way I think about things. You look like hell, go change. Most of you men will retreat to what you think is neutral ground on that question. You look fine. And every woman knows fine stands for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Fine. It's this middle ground. So we do this with all these things. Now one of the criticisms of virtue ethics is, A, how do we know that that's the end of a human being? I think Aristotle has a very good formulation. The second criticism is, even if we decide that these are the virtues, can we teach them? I think we can, at least we try to. We do this throughout school. We are taught things in school like what? We, we try to teach virtues beginning at a very early age. You're taught what in school? Share. Share. Wait your turn, right? Take turns. We try to do this. And we have at least one example of somebody who actually did this. Benjamin Franklin, one of our nation's founders, was an enormously successful inventor, businessman, um, politician, statesman, philosopher, and scientist. He excelled in all of these areas. He didn't start out that way. He started out, he knew he had certain leadership qualities, but it got people into trouble. He decided, for example, there were some stones that had been delivered to build a house, and he decided it would be just so much better to use those stones to build a little wharf where he and his friends could fish off of them. His father caught him, he said, nothing is worth having that isn't honest. And he set about reforming himself. He came up with a list of 13 virtues. You can Google it. In fact, there's a project called 13virtues.com, I think, or 13virtues.org that show Franklin's virtues. He put them down on a little piece of ivory, and he worked on them every day. Why 13? The same reason that historically there were 13 episodes of a sitcom in a series. You had a fall lineup, a spring lineup, and then you could have two complete sets of reruns because if you multiply 13 by 4, it comes out to what? 52, which is what? How many weeks are in a year? So I came up with 13. You could go through four complete cycles in a year. And he would mark them down, and if he noticed what he called spots on his piece of ivory, there was more work to do on that virtue. But it's a pretty good system. He rose from very humble and modest beginnings to be one of our most successful American statesmen, and a very successful businessman, one of the most successful founding fathers, maybe. So I think it's a good start. With that in mind, let's look and see if there's a biological basis. This is a video. I will tell you that there's a part in this video, if you're offended by uh, uh, sex, there's a part in this video where Dr. DeWall shows uh, uh, two bonobos, which are primates having sex, and he comes up with what he thinks of the killers of morality. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's an interesting thing to think about. And then on Thursday, we'll watch a video that talks about marketing um, ethics in research. <coughs> I was born in Den Bosch, where the painter Hieronymus Bosch named himself after. And so I've always been very fond of this painter, who lived and worked in the 15th century. And what is interesting about him in relation to morality is he lived at a time where religion's influence was waning, and he was sort of wondering, I think, what would happen in society if there was no religion or if there was less religion. And so he painted his famous painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, which some have interpreted as being humanity before the fall, or being humanity without any fall at all. And so, and so it makes you wonder what would happen if we hadn't tasted the fruit of knowledge, so to speak, and, and what kind of morality we would have. Much later, as a student, I went to a very different garden, a zoological garden in, in Arnhem, uh, where we keep chimpanzees. This is me at an early age with a baby chimpanzee. And uh, I discovered there that uh, chimpanzees are very power hungry and wrote a book about it. And at that time, the focus in a lot of animal research was on aggression and competition. I think the whole picture of the animal kingdom and humanity included was that deep down we are competitors, we are aggressive, we are all out for our own profit, basically. This is the launch of my book. Uh, I'm not sure how well the chimpanzees read it, but they surely seemed interested in the book. Now, in the process of doing all this 
work on power and dominance and aggression and so on, I discovered that chimpanzees reconcile after fights. And so, but you see, here is two males who have had a fight, they ended up in a tree, and one of them pulls out a hand to the other. And about a second after I took the picture, they came together in the fork of the tree and they kissed and embraced each other. Now this is very interesting because at the time everything was about competition and aggression, and so it wouldn't make any sense. The only thing that matters is that you win or that you lose. But why would you reconcile after a fight? That doesn't make any sense. And this is the way bonobos do it. Bonobos do everything with sex. And so they also reconcile with sex. But the principle is exactly the same. The principle is that you have a valuable relationship that is damaged by conflict, so you need to do something about it. And so I, my, my whole picture of the animal kingdom, and including humans also, started to change at that time. So we have this image in political science, economics, the humanities, philosophy, for that matter, that man is a wolf to man. And so deep down, our nature is actually nasty. I think it's a very unfair image for the wolf. And the wolf is, is, after all, a very cooperative animal. And that's why many of you have a dog at home, which has all these characteristics also. And it's very unfair to humanity, because humanity is actually much more cooperative and empathic than, you, than they're given credit for. And so I started getting interested in those issues and studying that in other animals. So these are the pillars of morality. If you ask anyone what is morality based on, uh, these are the two factors that always come out. One is reciprocity, and associated with it is a sense of justice and a sense of fairness. And the other one is empathy and compassion. And human morality is more than this, but if you would remove these two pillars, uh, there would be not much remaining, I think, and so they're absolutely essential. So let me give you a few examples here. This is a very old video from the Yerkes Primary Center where they train chimpanzees to cooperate. So this is already about 100 years ago that we were doing experiments on cooperation. And what you have here is two young chimpanzees who have a box, and the box is too heavy for one chimp to pull in. And of course, there's food on the box, otherwise they wouldn't be pulling so hard. And so they're bringing in the box. And you can see that they're synchronized. You can see that they work together. They pull at the same moment. It's already a big advance over, over many other animals who wouldn't be able to do that. And now you're going to get a more interesting picture, because now one of the two chimps has been fed. So one of the two is not really interested in the task anymore. One is that the chimp on the right has a full understanding he needs the partner, so full understanding of the need for cooperation. The second one is that the partner is willing to work even though he's not interested in food. Why would that be? Well, that probably has to do with reciprocity. There's actually a lot of evidence in, in primates and other animals that they return favors, and so he, he will get a return favor at some point in the future. And so that's how this all operates. We do the same task with elephants. Now, with elephants, it's very dangerous to work with elephants. And another problem with elephants is that you cannot make an apparatus that is too heavy for a single elephant. Now, now you can probably make it, but it's going to be a, a pretty clumsy apparatus, I think. And so what we did in their case, it is we do these studies in Thailand with Josh Potnik, is we have an apparatus around of which there's a rope, a single rope. And if you pull on this side of the rope, the rope disappears on the other side. So two elephants need to pick it up at exactly the same time and pull. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen, and the rope disappears. And so the first tape you're going to see is two elephants who are released together, arrive at the apparatus, the apparatus is on the left, with food on it. And so they come together, they arrive together, they pick it up together, and they pull together. So this is actually fairly simple for them. There they are. And so that's how they bring it in. 
But now we're going to make it more difficult because the, the whole purpose of this experiment is to see how well they understand cooperation. Do they understand it as well as the chimps, for example? And so what we do in the next step is we release one elephant before the other, and that elephant needs to be smart enough to stay there and wait and not pull at the rope, because if he pulls at the rope, it disappears and the whole test is over. Now this elephant does something illegal that we did not teach it, but it shows the understanding that he has because he puts his big foot on the rope, stands on the rope, and waits there for the other, and then the other is going to do all the work for him. So, so it's, it's what we call freeloading. <laughs> But, but it shows uh, the intelligence that the elephants had. They, they developed several of these alternative techniques that we did not approve of necessarily. So the other elephant is now coming. And it's going to pull it in. reciprocity part. Now something on empathy. Empathy is my main topic at the moment of research and empathy has sort of two qualities. One is the understanding part of it. This is just a regular definition, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another and the emotional part. And so empathy has basically two channels. One is the body channel. If you talk with a sad person, you're going to adopt a sad expression and a sad posture and before you know it you feel sad. And that's sort of the, the body channel of, emo of emotional empathy which many animals have. Your average dog has that also. That's actually why people keep mammals in the home and not turtles or snakes or something like that, who don't have that kind of empathy. And then there's a cognitive channel, which is more that you can take the perspective of somebody else. And, and that's more limited. There's few animals. I think elephants and apes can do that kind of thing, but there are very few animals who can do that. So synchronization, which is part of that whole empathy mechanism, is a very old one in the animal kingdom. And in humans, of course, we can study that with yawn contagion. Humans yawn when others yawn, and it's related to empathy. It, it, it activates the same areas in the brain. It also, we know that people who have a lot of yawn contagion are highly empathic. People who have problems with empathy, such as autistic children, they don't have yawn contagion. So it is connected. And we study that in our chimpanzees by presenting them with an animated head. So that's what you see on the upper left, an animated head that yawns. And there's a chimpanzee watching, an actual real chimpanzee watching a computer screen on which we play these animations. And so yarn contagion that you're probably all familiar with, and maybe you're going to start yarning soon now, uh, is, is something that we share with other animals. And that's related to that whole body channel of synchronization that underlies empathy. And that is universal in the mammals, basically. Now, we also study more complex expressions. This is consolation. This is a male chimpanzee who has lost a fight, and he's screaming, and a juvenile comes over and puts an arm around him and calms him down. That's consolation. is very similar to human consolation. And uh, consolation behavior, it, it's, it's empathy-driven. It's empathy uh, that's actually the way they study empathy in human children is to instruct a family member to act distressed, and then they see what young children do. And so uh, it is related to empathy, and that's the kind of expressions we look at. We also recently published an experiment, you may have heard about it, on, on altruism in chimpanzees, uh, where the question is, do chimpanzees care about the welfare of somebody else? And, and for, for decades it had been assumed that only humans can do that, that only humans worry about the welfare of somebody else. And we did a very a simple experiment. We do that on chimpanzees that live in Lawrenceville, in the, in the field station of Yerkes, and so that, that's how they live, and we call them into a room and do experiments with them. In this case, we put two chimpanzees side by side, and one has a bucket full of tokens, and the tokens have different meanings. One kind of token feeds only the partner who chooses, the other one feeds both of them. So this, this is a study we did with Vicky Horner. And here you have the two colored tokens, so they have a whole bucket full of them, uh, and they have to pick one, one of the two colors. You will see how that goes. So if this chimp makes the selfish choice, which is the red token in this case, he needs to give it to us, we pick it up, we put it on the table where there's two food rewards, but in this case only the one on the right gets food and the one on the left walks away because she, she knows already that this is not a good test for her. And then the next one is the pro-social token, 
So the one who makes the choices, that's the interesting part here, for the one who makes the choices, it doesn't really matter. So she gives us now a pro-social token and both chimps get fed. So the one who makes the choices always get a reward. So it doesn't matter whatsoever, and she should actually be, be choosing blind. Because what we find is that they prefer the pro-social token. So this is the 50% line, that's the random expectation. And especially if the partner draws attention to itself, they, they choose more. And if the partner puts pressure on them, so if the partner starts spitting water and intimidating them, then the choices go down, and they actually don't want to... It's as if they're saying, if you're not behaving, I'm not going to be pro-social today. And this is what happens without a partner, when there's no partner sitting there. And so we found that the chimpanzees do care about the well-being of somebody else, especially these are other members of their own group. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees. Uh, with, with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. And then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. They didn't like this at all because they had decided in their mind, I believe, that, that, that uh, uh, fairness is a very complex issue and that animals cannot have it. And so one philosopher even wrote us that it was impossible that monkeys had a sense of fairness because fairness was invented during the French Revolution. So, now, and, and another one wrote a whole chapter saying that uh, he would believe it had something to do with fairness if the one who got grapes would refuse the grapes. Now the funny thing is that Sarah Bosman, who's been doing this with chimpanzees, had a, a couple of combinations of chimpanzees where indeed the one who would get the grape would refuse the grape until the other guy also got the grape. So we're getting very close to the human sense of fairness. And I think philosophers need to rethink their philosophy for a while. So let me summarize. I believe there's an evolved morality. I think morality is much more than what I've been talking about. But it would be impossible without these ingredients that we find in other primates, which are empathy and consolation, uh, pro-social tendencies, and reciprocity in the sense of fairness. And so we work on these particular issues to see if we can create a morality from the bottom up, so to speak, without necessarily God and religion involved, uh, and to see how we can get to an evolved morality. And I thank you for your attention.
a lot about this idea of fairness and empathy and its application to this era of value co-creation and relationship building that, that we are so interested in in this contemporary era. Well, we have to build sustaining relationships with our clients and partners to, to provide real value for the firm and for them as well. I think that's something to think about. On Thursday, we'll watch a video on marketing research and how we can engage in marketing research in maybe less than ethical ways that we ought to think about. So we'll do that on Thursday. Um, you all can turn in your revised uh, critical thinking challenge on the um, weighted averages, if you have that, and I'll look at those. I posted the grades for the justice critical thinking challenge, and uh, also be thinking about your group work. Uh, we'll start looking at that and your group projects uh, maybe next week.